Hello again. Now that we have a good idea of what makes up bone, let's talk about how it forms and how it grows. So following this, I would like you to be able to describe typical bone formation during embryonic development, describe intramembranous ossification in the bones formed through this process, describe endochondral ossification in the bones formed through that process, and differentiate interstitial and appositional growth. Now I want to note here that within this, we, I've included videos that talk you through the steps of both intramembranous and endochondral ossification. Now I would like you to focus on the basics of what type of tissue forms bone, the two routes of bone formation, and the way that bones form in general. However, I hope that you find these videos are an opportunity to apply what you've learned about bone cells and their functions and discuss the parts of bones in relation to that formation. So you will not be responsible for specific steps of these processes. So early in development around week six, a mesenchymal skeleton forms. This is that embryonic connective tissue kind of condenses in the form of a skeleton. So at this point of development, the neural tube has started to form and has these little vesicles. Um, so we're starting to see parts of the central nervous system coming, but the embryo is about the size of the average human fingernail. So this is quite early. So from here, the mesenchyme can ossify or form bone in one of two ways. The more direct way forms bone in mesenchyme. This is how many of the bones of the skull and a portion of the clavicle form. The rest of the bones of the body will use a route which requires a detour through a cartilage model. So the cartilage forms within mesenchyme and then bone forms within that cartilage model. And this image here in the middle represents anything in blue here. So all the bones except for those of the face, parts of the skull and the clavicle are formed through endochondral ossification, and anything in purple are formed through intramembranous ossification. So let's take intramembranous ossification first. So first we'll imagine that this upper left image shows the basic mesenchymal skeleton. We'll isolate one bone from this, and now what we see here is a cross-section of the mandible. So mesenchyme is well vascularized and blood brings nutrients and other factors to lead to the differentiation of osteoprogenitor cells. So this blood supply will bring factors that lead to the differentiation of the osteoprogenitor cells into which type of cells? So these are osteoblasts. Remember that osteoblasts build bone. So these secrete the bone matrix and then they initiate the process of calcification where hydroxyapatite crystals form hardening that matrix. Now osteoblasts will get trapped in the calcified matrix where they transition to become another type of cell. These here are osteocytes. And these osteocytes will monitor change within the bone tissue. So this initial bone that is formed is less well organized. So the cells that come in here are the osteoclasts and they consume, removing the parts of the bone through acidic secretions and leading to internal spaces opening up in the bones around the trabeculae of the spongy bone. The last part of bone to form is the periosteum its outer fibrous layer that is more protective, and then the inner cellular layer. So here we see dormant osteoprogenitor cells deep to the periosteum waiting to be recruited. We can also find osteoblasts and osteoclasts there. So this has been a short visual representation of intramembranous ossification, which forms the bones of the face, the flat bones of the skull, and the majority or the lateral portion of the clavicle. So this figure here shows a nice summary of the process of intramembranous ossification. 
Let's now take a look at endochondral ossification. We'll begin with the same mesenchymal skeleton and isolate one of the long bones to see the process. Chondroblasts will replace the mesenchymal model with hyaline cartilage. And this becomes a hyaline cartilage model, which will, in turn then, grow in length and in width. Then we'll see that blood vessels bring osteoprogenitor cells and factors that will transition them to become osteoblasts. And these will start laying that bone matrix and initiating the process of calcification. This is the process by which the bone collar or the periosteal collar is formed at the diaphysis. The formation of the bone collar disrupts diffusion to the cartilage and the chondroblasts in the central part of the bone, leading to their death. Osteoblasts come in and lay bone in their place at what is called the primary ossification center. Next, osteoclasts enter to remove debris and begin the formation of trabeculae and of the medullary cavity. So working together, osteoblasts build up bone where osteoclasts remove bone. So next, blood vessels infiltrate the epiphyses at what is called the secondary ossification centers. And here, osteoblasts form bone and osteoclasts resorb or remove bone to form trabeculae of the spongy bone. Then bone grows in multiple dimensions. Growth in length is called interstitial growth, which happens through endochondral ossification at epiphyseal plates. This adds bone on the diaphyseal side, which grows the shaft of the bone or the diaphysis in length. So bone also grows in width through appositional growth. This takes place directly on the surface of bone or just superficial to the medullary cavity. So eventually, epiphyseal plates are replaced by bone and called epiphyseal lines, and growth in length stops. The hyaline cartilage remains on the ends of the bones as articular cartilage. And here we see that the periosteum fully surrounds the bone firmly attached to it everywhere except where that articular cartilage is found. So this was a simplified version of endochondral ossification, which forms the base of the skull and then most other bones of the body. So here again is an illustration to demonstrate the basics of this process now, endochondral ossification. At birth, the infant skeleton looks incredibly different from the adult skeleton. Bones forming through intramembranous ossification, like those flat bones of the skull and those of the face, have fully ossified. Now joints and font or fontanelles remain between these bones of the skull that allow for further growth and some flexibility. Eventually, these will close through intramembranous ossification. Now the bones that form through endochondral ossification have fully ossified at the diaphysis. So we're at this step here where the primary ossification center has formed bone, but the ends of the bones remain cartilaginous. Now let's revisit the two types of bone growth. While we're in our ripe years of middle and high school, we tend to grow a lot in height, all at different times. Now I grew about an inch a year from seventh to 10th grade, leading me to be super tall, always. Now this growth is made possible by this little sheet of hyaline cartilage. which is found within the metaphysis, and that's called the epiphyseal plate, or the growth plate. Now this growth happens through endochondral ossification, where bone is added on this diaphyseal side and grows the shaft in length. Now interestingly, every bone has a primary growth side, 
so the ends of bones grow unevenly. The other type of growth is called appositional growth, where the bone grows in width. This takes place directly on the surface of the bone or extending from that medullary cavity. Appositional growth occurs, for instance, when you use a muscle a lot. As there's increased pulling on the surface, superficial blood vessels get trapped and then the bone grows around it to form an osteon. The final step of endochondral ossification, when bones are fully formed and stop growing in length, does not happen in many of our bones until our mid to late 20s. We can see that the epiphyseal plates in the sacrum can remain open or remain as cartilage into our early 30s. So different bones fuse at different times in the same person, and even different parts of the same bone can fuse at different times. So anthropologists will use the closure of a growth plate to determine the age of remains that were found. And I don't need you to know the specifics of these, I just wanted to show some examples. Another thing to see on this slide is this image here is showing epiphyseal plates, where they exist in a femur. So our first question for this session is which type of ossification forms the femur? How about the frontal bone? So pause so you can take a moment to pick your answer. So the femur is a long bone, and that forms through endochondral ossification. How about the frontal bone? So this, the frontal bone, as well as other flat bones of the skull, will form through intramembranous ossification. So most bones of the body will be through endochondral. The intramembranous ossification will be those bones of the face, the flat bones of the skull, and then the lateral portion of the clavicle. In our second question, which process of bone growth takes place near the periosteum? Again, pause to choose your answer. So the periosteum is at the bone surface, and this type of growth might happen in the response to the pull of skeletal muscles. And this is called appositional growth, which is growth in width. Where does interstitial growth take place? This will be at the epiphyseal plates. and result in growth in length. So thanks so much for your attention. I will see you in the next video.